Pleasure to be here. This is my first CA UK uh, presentation. Uh, it's very exciting. Uh, I run an organisation based in the northwest of England called Monument Men. Uh, we provide photogrammetry to uh, small independent museums, maybe uh, local authority museums, basically people who can't afford to bring in the big guns to do major capital works. Um, through doing this, I've, I've attended a number of different conferences, Egyptological events. I have an interest in Egyptology, a uh, major interest. I specialise in uh, the graffiti of um, Western travellers who began to come out into Egypt in the early 19th century and a little bit before. Um, in doing so, I came across links with people that were collecting objects, uh, which led me to look at animal mummies. Um, so why a CAA UK conference are we talking about animal mummies? Well, just to give you a brief primer if you don't know anything about animal mummies, um, generally made in uh, different dynastic periods in Egypt. Um, there is evidence of mummification in other areas, but we're predominantly focusing on Egypt. Um, they used animals that pertained to the different cult gods, so crocodiles, snakes, uh, various different different animals. Um, now, during the Ptolemaic period, which is when you had Greek pharaohs in Egypt, um, animal mummification and religious cults were used as a form of political control. So, uh, animal mummy production was m basically mobilised to a mass industrial level, um, and as such, there was a there was you know there was, there was an industrial process behind it. So. Um, Looking back to the modern day, uh, when we're looking at these in UK museums and collections, and particularly UK excava excavators that have gone out to Egypt um, to, to basically unearth these, um, they were they were they're a very attractive item. There was a lot of travellers, wealthy travellers, going over in the 1800s. They were collecting large uh, sarcophagi, human mummies, things like that. Not everybody had the means, financial means, and the personal means to uh, to to make that happen to collect large human mummies. So a very easy portable thing to do because animal mummies are incredibly numerous was to buy, a, buy an animal mummy from a seller, stick it in your suitcase, bring it back home. Uh, and that basically formed a large part of people's individual cabinets of curiosities, things like that. Um, when these people died, things were then passed on with no provenance or anything because they were just collected objects. Um, these then found their way into local national museum collections and as such, uh, if one wants to study or take a look at these animal mummies, you have an enormous wide range of animal mummies scattered in a disparate way through collections across the whole of the UK. Um, because they are, um, because now we, we live in a modern age where uh, ethical considerations are in human remains but also in animal remains, a lot of people aren't really doing mummy unwrappings. You know, that it's something that's quite seriously frowned upon in these days, particularly with human. Uh, with, with ethical considerations for humans, we apply the same ethical considerations to an mummified animals. Um, so instead of performing physical mummy unwrappings, um, animal mummies provide us with an absolutely ideal subject to test non-invasive uh, imaging techniques. So whether you're looking at the exterior of an animal mummy or whether you're looking inside using microspect CT scans and volume renders, things like that, it's an absolutely perfect opportunity. Um, so, to introduce, um, we use CT, uh, CT imaging. You'll see here this is a volume render using Mimix um, of pretty much the rock star of, of our presentation to get today. Um, this is a, a cat coffin that was um, made in the Ptolemaic era. It does have a mummy inside it. It's a wooden coffin on the outside with a small package um, with a mummy, which is, which is shown in skeletal data as well. Um, but CT scanning gives us a really good way to see inside something. Is, uh, something. If you are a photogrammetrist, it doesn't matter how good a photogrammetrist you are, you'll never see inside what, what you're looking at. So, but conversely, CT imaging, while it can give us really interesting uh, feedback in terms of materiality, you can see on here, you can see a number of, a number of areas that are highlighted on this, on this coffin. Um, it still doesn't show us any of the uh, any of the coloured material, anything, anything to do with the with, with the surface or any of the crafts that take that were taking place. Um, so we're looking at surface recording, and because animal mummies as uh, subject 
are scattered and disparate through the UK, it's very difficult for us to get out and record them, both in terms of CT scanning. Uh, we're fortunate at Manchester with the uh, biobank that we use Manchester Children's Hospital uh, while there's kids there, which is great fun when you wheel a, a, a crocodile mummy past them and wonder what the hell's going on. Um, yeah, kids are great. Uh, it, well, it's, I suppose it's engagement. Um, but we could look at using laser scanning, structured light, um, some you know particularly expensive means of doing things, but you cannot roll that out across an entire nation with small disparate collections that you may need the assistance of people who are working at that museum or a volunteer, or volunteer there to get that data acquisition for you. Uh, it's very difficult to do. Um, so as a result, there's lots of bold claims about photogrammetry. Oh, it's really accessible. You can just do it with your mobile phone. There's all these sort of bold claims. Now, we thought, when we were starting to look at animal mummies, we thought, well, you know, a lot of people make these bold claims, but let's to put this to the test seriously. Um, we had a number of research questions. So can photogrammetry provide us useful insights into animal mummies? Uh, it's a little bit of a biased question, we know it can, um, and, but particularly when it's combined with radiographic or CT data as well. Um, could we train volunteers and museum workers to carry this data acquisition out for us? We're talking earlier about the, um, the, the democratization of photogram, you know, potential of photogrammetry. That was, I didn't have that buzzword in mind, but that was definitely definitely the thing we were focusing on. Um, can it be done with no specialised equipment at all? Literally the bold claim of, you can just use your mobile phone and bash a scan up. Could we apply that to an animal we collection? Um, and what kinds of outcomes, come, outputs can we actually get from it as well? Um, so we looked at different considerations. So minimal handling of subjects. Generally, mummified animals are a very fragile object. Um, we looked at the ease and speed of actually getting your data capture um, and also in terms of recording and archiving, we basically printed a, uh, we, we designed and printed a, a sheet for recording. Uh, it was very interesting seeing some of the other ones that were shared earlier. Um, and we wanted something that was very easy to disseminate our results or, uh, or basically information from the photogrammetry shoots that we did. Uh, so here you can see again, the same, uh, the same object, the Ptolemaic cat coffin. That's been uh, handled by Manchester Museum's conservator. Uh, we aimed with this to have no handling at all, personally. Uh, I do do that with other objects that I work with, but on this we wanted to completely take our hands off as it, and put ourselves in the position of a volunteer or a member of museum staff who's never done this before. Um, so our methodology, um, or what methodology is the case may be, um, we wanted to keep it as simple as possible. Um, we wanted to use sourceable, uh, easily sourceable or packed equipment. Um, in the case of turntable scanning, we weren't looking at automated methods. We were just quite simply, big shout out to IKEA. Uh, there's the camera we're on the, the 499 IKEA turntable. Um, but in order, in, order to, um, in order to control that and, and create a measurable, um, you know, a, a more metricized system, uh, we simply designed and printed uh, something that almost looked like a, a large protractor to go over the top of it so we could measure the angles. So we're rotating every 10 degrees, taking a photograph there. Uh, and that, that created something that was a simple, easy to, uh, easy to follow process. Uh, we also did a number, of other scan, uh, another, uh, a number of different other scanning techniques. So you can see there, it, from the three images, uh, we have um, a light box. This is a simple 80 quid light box from Amazon, what people use for product photography. Uh, you can also use it for holding animal mummies in. Um, we uh, used a tripod and uh, a light tent system and also just did basic roving, roving scanning, just moving around with a camera um, and tested a number of different uh, types of uh, data capture. Um, we had a, a basic workflow, which I'll, uh, I'll not bore you with too much, uh, but it was basically the object might be in the store, have it assessed by a conservator first. If you get the go ahead to do the work, they handle it, but you carry it at the shoot, uh, following the instructions that we, we devised. Um, and at the end of it, once we'd actually generated a scan, one thing that um, I, I always try and put in is the, the potential for people, because we wanted this to be an easy methodology, we needed it to be forgiven. And because we were giving, we were planning to give this to people who've never done it before, we wanted to say, it's okay to fail. If you don't generate a decent, a decent 
scan model, that's okay. You can go back and reshoot. And that gives people the capacity to learn. So we made sure in our, in our methodology that there was time made available for a reshoot if required. Um, again, again, then when we came to win outputs, we had a number of different output vectors that we could look at, uh, whether it was reproduction, including 3D printing, um, improved interpretation, or just an upload to Sketchfab. Um, I am a bit of a Sketchfab evangelist, so I, I'm always plumbing it. And I noticed it's, it seems to have just been the word that's followed most of the conferences, people stating that they love Sketchfab. Um, again, processing stages. Uh, this was just um, was just over 200 images, I think, uh, for the Ptolemaic cat coffin. Got a sparse and a dense cloud. I, I presented this at a reproductions conference in Newcastle uh, a few months ago. And someone came up to me and said, oh, your, your photos are wrong. I said, How's that? And they said, oh, you, you said you've got your dense cloud there. That's not your dense cloud, mate. That's your, that's your textures. No, I'm pretty sure it's my dense cloud. Uh, until I took my computer out, loaded 3D Zephyr up and said, no, that is my dense cloud. I can show you. Uh, they were quite insistent that I got it wrong. Um, so we, again, we had, we had a decent results from our processing stages. But the real highlights came from this object that, yes, people handle. Uh, yes, people look at. It's... Um, this cat coffin's pretty much a rock star. It's going around a lot of the uh, traveling tour, the Animal Mummies Revealed tour. Um, and it's a big favorite with people, but it's usually displayed in a darkened environment. And even in a conservation lab environment, you can't get too close to it because it is quite fragile. Um, so we have the volume render from the mix, which I, I showed earlier. Um, and then we have the photogrammetry results. So you can see quite clearly from this, you've got a number of inked details coming up um, you got a more enhanced look at the wood doweling, which was used to, to manufacture it. That was a common theme on some of the other um, subjects in the pilot study. Um, but you also got a few things. Although we do have a little bit of blur in here, um, you can actually see a painted pectoral detail, which we weren't aware of previously. It doesn't generally show up in, in good light. Um, you could also see very fine sub-millimetre level uh, whiskers that are inked on. And uh, again, the same on the feet detail. Uh, we didn't find any, any glyphic details or anything like that, but the whole thing was covered with gesso, uh, which was then inked and painted in parts. So we're, we're dealing with an object that's thousands of years old. Any detail is good. Um, but this enabled us to see the object and to virtually handle the object in a way that we hadn't done previously. Um, and a couple of other subjects that we worked with. Um, here you've got the, uh, the photogrammetry textured render. Um, the mesh and this is an x-ray. Interesting subject, the gilded falcon mummy, um, because it actually doesn't contain a falcon in it at all. Um, a lot of people, when people speak about animal mummies, uh, they, they have the opinion that uh, votive mummies such as this that do not have any animal remains inside at all. Um, generally when we speak or, or give lectures on this, people will say, oh, it's just a cheap fake then. Well, actually no. The, uh, the gilding uh, just up at the top here, there's a gilded faceplate that you can see there. I can't, can't see it on the CT slice. But that gilded faceplate, we estimate, um, and we've, we've not tested this with an experiment yet, but we estimate it would take potentially hundreds of hours to produce that. Not, the, not just the wrappings, but just the faceplate itself. So not in terms of man hours, that's not the sort of thing that you would, you know, you just consider a cheap fake. Um, so that gave us some... Interesting, uh, interesting results to contrast. Um, also, it, I mean, in this CT scan slice, you have a large crack in the mummy here, uh, which conservation have, uh, have taken steps to uh, stop any further damage to, um, which you can't see on the exterior. So when I was talking earlier about the, the advantages of being able to blend both technologies uh, and both in insights from internal modeling and exterior, you've got an immediate result there. Um, two other types of mummies that we scanned as well. We had a, a, common, uh, a common form of cat mummy, which just looks like a skittle. Um, nicknamed those skittle cats. And uh, believe it or not, this is a shrew. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's quite an interesting piece. We, we looked at both of these and we started to look at the textures. We ha there's never been any sampling done with these. Um, if, if, any, if any fragments have fell off while they've been handled, they've been kept for samples, but there's never been any invasive samples taken of these. Um, and again, we have a snake coffin here. This one's quite interesting. Um, I should have really uh, added an image of the side of the coffin here. 
Um, even though it doesn't work now, we weren't able to turn that because conservation considerations, the, uh, the, the, snake, um, the snake vertebrae that are inside um, are on, in a very loose position. And if you turn the snake coffin over, it will just simply come out. So we decided to abort at the point of uh, wanting to turn it over to give a, give a full 360 model. Um, but something quite interesting with this that we found on the science that I didn't highlight is we looked at the we looked at the image we've looked at the CT scans of the of the coffin before we started work on it. It's only when we did a photogrammetry scan and looked at the exterior of it we didn't know how the coffin fitted together. There's a there's a small plug at the top here that's loose. We don't know what that was for. Possibly putting the snake inside uh, when it originally went in. But we, we didn't know how it fitted together. But we found when we did the photogrammetry scan on the sides here, uh, there's a number of wood devils that no longer work. They, they're, they're obviously um, wasted away. But we could identify that, whereas CT scanning did not show that up. And just surface looking at the, the, uh, the coffin did not show that up either. So immediately we're finding a couple of finds um, based on the materiality of the objects. Uh, again, a juvenile crocodile mummy. Um, you can see there, it's not picked up the wrappings perfectly, but I would imagine if we used um, higher strength equipment, lasers, or uh, possibly even a, a DSLR, we'd be able to get that. Um, with all of these, we, uh, with most of these, we just opted for a, a Nikon bridge camera, not an SLR, no lenses, nothing fancy, just a tripod to mount it on and a remote control and the, and the turntable. But the results, although they're replicable, it, it still, seems to, seems, still seems to have worked well. Um, so as a general highlight of our pilot study, um, each of the different photogrammetry methodologies that we were experimenting with uh, yielded successful results uh, in different, you know, to different degrees, but they, they were all successful. Um, some significant features were highlighted on the exterior surface, where, uh, which I showed you earlier. Um, the resulting models have been made 3D printable, um, and we've been, with some of the exhibitions, just done a, a number of talks at the National Trust where we brought some 3D printed replicas that people could handle. Um, doing that in the museum space when people are walking through and looking at these objects in terms of engagement and interpretation, people love it, absolutely love it. Particularly the kids, they love it. Um, we had some miniature cat coffins made. We actually talked about making chocolate cat mummies, but you know. Um, yeah, so the work that we've done, although we're not, not quite published yet, um, we're hoping to use this to form the basis of a replicable methodology that we can use specifically for photogrammetry and for disparate collections. Uh, by the nature, they are scattered across the country. Uh, we're hoping to start experimenting with more volunteers. At the moment, we have uh, about 10, yeah, just, yeah, about 10, 12 volunteers that are working for us at the moment. Uh, we're working predominantly in the Northwest at the moment, Wigan, Bolton, Manchester, a number of other museum sites, but we're looking to expand um, very soon we're working down in Derby um, in just over a week actually uh, working on some animal mummies there and again we're just going to continue expanding uh, whether that's going to be led by us or whether we're going to um, push for volunteers to lead it it's just going to be a reactionary rollout I think um, so all pilot sub study subjects uh, the six uh, pilot study subjects I showed you earlier they're now available online um, on our sketch website um, the, we put some annotation images on it so that people uh, annotations with images that you can see um, while you're looking around to see different details uh, within the mummy that uh, a number of us met um, a conservator um, our lead researcher and the curator at Manchester to discuss these to see if there's anything that we could highlight any particular objects if you were showing people these objects what would you put, draw their attention to and just annotated them in 3D. Uh, I thought it would be an, an interesting way for people in to, get, to engage as the Sketchpad model. Um, we're, now, uh, we're now working on uh, developing some audio descriptions. So I'd like a curatorial description. Um, I'd like a lead researcher description. I was asked to, to do a description as a photogrammetrist, but really what can I say apart from I took photos of it and this happened. You know, it's, it's quite difficult. Um, but the, uh, we're now working on developing Sketchfab's API viewer, uh, has recently had uh, some, um, some uh, media presence um, where there are ways of displaying um, objects on there where you can create transparent multi-layered models. So we're looking at doing the same thing with an external photogrammetry scan that's, um, that's highlighted and annotated, 
but then using the API viewer to, to remove that layer and virtually unwrap the mummy. So taking the, any of the internal materials from a CT scan or a volume render, um, and then move inwards so people can see the mummy in stages of how it was created or, or what it's made up of. Um, that's basically where we've been up to over the last 12 months. Um, I only started working with the Biobank in February 2018, so we're already trying to rush ahead and get published. Um, I'll just show you a quick last video. Um, I really like that. Every, everyone loves animations. Um, and again, thank you very much for listening. Thank you.